Welcome to Critical Role Demystified. I'm Mike Christensen, and this is the show where we talk about the lessons we can learn as dungeon masters and as players from Lessons of Critical Role. Hello, this is the second part of a two-part interview with Super Geek Mike. If you want to watch the first, it is linked down in the description. I think this is a good moment for us to transition over to the Matt Mercer effect. Uh, Because I wanted to watch essentially that whole video with you. Um, So, because I thought that there was literally just like every other word you said, I was like, I want to be like on stream, like pausing and and running the timer (laughs) to talk about it. Because you knew about Critical Role. How much did you know about the Matt Mercer effect? I literally only knew it uh, contextually and like colloquially. So I had never actually seen Matt Mercer. Um, So I only knew the Matt Mercer effect as a super negative thing. Um, And and just like as a, oh, like this person watched Critical Role, like wait for the Matt Mercer effect. And so that was, it was that um, general knowledge of critter activity on Twitter even though I'm, I'm not really that active on Twitter, so it was mostly like third-hand knowledge of it. Uh-huh. Um, and then the uh, the Vampire Hunt Dark. Those were the three things I knew about Critical Role. <laughs> 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 so the, the Matt Mercer effect is something that I have been actually like actively trying to identify almost as yeah. I watch through the series of like, what do people even mean? Because it's, like, been hard for me to, like, even quantify what that is. And I think that you laid it out pretty succinctly. Okay. It's it's tough to see it in Critical Role because that's not where it appears. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And and which is really... I think that what I have landed on... And, like, what I've I've talked somewhat with Chad about it is, like... You know, it it has to do with the way that people who got into D&D from Critical Role act. And so... It's something that you, in a roundabout way, were identifying a concern about in... What was it? Monday's video? Uh, With the Sun Tree episode, when you were like... Mm. Yeah. With with the Sun Tree scene, when you were like, I hope people who got into Critical Role, you know, who got into D&D through Critical Role... And, and got into DMing through Critical Role are respecting their players and, and being aware of lines and veils. Yeah. Um, be, and, and that is, in a way, expressing concern about what we would identify as a version of the Matt Mercer effect. Although, right. although safety tools are less a part of the conversation just because safety tools, the Critical Role safety tools are not really visible. Yeah. Um, which, again, is something we, whole other topic. I would be much more. I think Critical Role should be more visible with their safety tools in some way. I think at least if they're pre-recording their shows, they should have content warnings. But I know their audience would would complain about spoilers if there were content warnings in the description. Yeah. And um, that is, again, that audience wanting what they had consistently before and yeah. not wanting change. So. And, and you know, okay, so before we watch the video... Uh... <laughs> So something that uh, I, I I only like very briefly touched on, but I actually want to go back speaking about, you know, what actual plays can do versus what you can do at your home game and mm-hmm. specifically what sort of resources you should give your players before session one and, and session zero, you know, yeah. a- actual plays can't, or not to say that they can't, but they often don't uh publicize you know their their safety conversations with their players beforehand they right. they don't do a lot of that is there other things that maybe wouldn't work in actual plays or people wouldn't have gotten from critical role that you think are really important to do at home games or even vice versa things that APs do that you wouldn't recommend for home games yeah i mean i think the fact that we don't see critical role break kayfabe when scenes like that happen they don't do a check-in that we see Mm. is something that i wouldn't recommend and that's because they have a level of trust i mean there's there's a moment that i remember seeing on twitter where like a a big dramatic thing was happening and it was like someone on twitter pointed out that like matt turned and like winked at ashley or like nodded to her or something to be sort of be like hey just make sure you're okay with what we're we're doing right here and she like nodded and that was like their way of expressing it yeah and and that's cool they, i'm sure they are having some sorts of conversations mm-hmm. um and i and i know there was and I, again i'm not on twitter as much anymore uh because it's bad for my mind and soul but <laughs> yeah at the time 
when I was really deep in it, I remember seeing people be like, oh, we should like see people session zeros, and then other people kind of pushing back and being like, no, because that needs to be private. I mm. still kind of like, I kind of wish people would at least, like actual plays would at least put out a list of like the final collated versions of their consent forms. You know, mm. something that's sort of like, these are the topics that we're not going to cover, and these are the topics that we might touch on. And here's everything else that's on the list that's on the table. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's, I mean, I, I run a game on Start Playing, and like, I made a list of like every possible ism and phobia that yeah. like, you know, not that because I expect, might be a line or a veil. You know, I don't expect there to be he heavy alcohol abuse, for example, sure. you know, but like, I don't have any plans to avoid it. Yeah. And so people should know that that's on the table, you well, know, something that is is a line for uh, players in my home game was in the Sundry episode. It is it is violence against children yes. like that for yeah. one of my players. That is a heavy line for them. And they like do not even want it to be implied within the world, yeah. which is completely fair, but sure. would take that Sundry episode just out of it, um, yeah. which is fine. Like you, you course correct. You, yeah. You figure something else out. Yeah. Um, I mean, you could just have... I think that that Suntree episode and that dread that is instilled is more effective because it's a child, but you could just have it be a halfling or a gnome adult. Yeah. And, like, it, I, I it, do know. think it would take away from the dread, but you need to respect the player boundaries in that case. And also, people, you know, when people who really, like, get bent out of shape about that, like, oh, I can't have the thing I want. It's like, they're not going to know. They're not going to know that it was almost a child. Yeah. Like, yeah, they, they wouldn't would have thought of it. Yeah. You know why? Because that's some Joker shit. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you wouldn't think of that because you're not a so a, a, a lunatic. Because <laughs> um, you're not a serial killer. Um, but the Briarwoods are. I yeah. mean, not, they're not, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Not, yeah. not right in so many ways. Yeah. But they did hang people in effigy. They're clearly not good. Right, um, right. They're clearly villains, and they're clearly so hot and sexy, which all of the villains need to be. Um, yes, exactly. <laughs> um, but, that's so funny that, like, the reason they're hot and sexy is just because of Matt's voice. That's all <laughs> it is. Like, I remember when, like, they mentioned a pre-stream enemy and in one of the Q&As. And, like, Laura and Marisha were like, yeah, he was hot. And I was, was like, what so do you mean? Hot. It was just Matt's voice. Dude, Kavard That's was it. probably hot. He was a hot beholder. If he's a villain, he has to be sexy. Uh, That's how it works. <laughs> I do, I literally, <laughs> in my notes, I have, <laughs> should all all CR villains should be hot? Should all villains be hot? Um, <laughs> um, I do think that I, I I think Critical Role should publish content warnings these days, and I think yeah. that's sort of necessary. I don't actually know if Dimension 20 does. I um, don't know. That'd be a good question. Yeah. I don't know, because I've not watched it in a long time. That's but, interesting. you know, if you're pre-recording, I feel like you ought to, you know. Yeah, I could, and I and I could see, you know, when it was live, Matt has some idea of some of the things that will come up, but especially when you're pre-recording, yeah, you know exactly what happened during the episode. And, like, you can put... I feel like you can put it at the bottom of the description and you can be like fucking, you know, content warning, spoilers ahead, like, yeah. you know, whatever. I, I feel like there's, or, and this was something that I have uh, thought about. You can have a, a website. Cause I know that w critical role has like a, like what time is critical role website, right? Or something along those lines. I don't think they're the ones who run that, but yes, that does exist. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But you can have something uh, along those lines where, you know, you have uh, a blog or a website uh, related to yeah. content warnings. And you just say, like, here's the link to the content warnings. Like, if you don't want to know, don't click it. But yeah. it's there if you need it. Um, yeah, I mean, having it be a separate link is, you know, I don't I don't I don't personally know if that's the right move. But that's an like there are options. Is yeah, the yeah. Point. there, there are I, a ton of options. But again, I think they are very worried about the backlash from a, an audience that doesn't want spoilers. Yeah, um, yeah. Which I understand. I mean, I, 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 you know, do a show where I don't want spoilers either, which does yeah. inherently mean that I can't give content warnings because I haven't seen it and I like don't know what's happening. Um, yeah. So I, I, I definitely get it. It's it's hard because and and I honestly didn't really think about it right now, but. 
until right now, but it would have been nice to be able to give a content warning for the Sun Tree episode. But I, you know, if I know what's coming up, then it sort of, it, it does degrade my stream experience, or er, the product that I'm making. So it's, yeah, it's hard. I have the benefit of being able to say, hey, everybody, time code's up here. I'm going to talk about, you know, violence against a child and violence against an animal, you yeah. know, because there's a bear hanging from the sun tree as well. Yeah. You know, um, might be something I think about. In future. And then I get to mute people who complain about comment about content warnings. <laughs> so everybody wins. <laughs> everybody wins. Uh, all right. Let's let's do. Oh, there are my notes. Uh, yeah, I thought you didn't know TV. That's not like a Doctor Who quote. What? What did? Everybody wins sounded a lot like everybody lives from the oh, Doctor Who. I do I well it's funny because I have watched Doctor Who. Uh it's one of the few TV shows I have watched. <laughs> <laughs> My TV show watching experience is limited, but there are there are some I love Oh my gosh. You, okay, I don't even think I wrote a question about it, but I was um one of your <laughs> one of your videos you were talking about Star Wars versus Star Trek. And uh -huh. I wanted to tell you how poignant you are, probably even when you don't mean to be, of okay. like you were talking about how, you know, critical. It's in oh, this one. Wait, it's in this one. We'll talk about yeah. it. Yeah. Never mind. Okay, cool. We'll talk about it. I quote so much, but okay. they apply a lot in this video. This was one of the things I was really curious to hear you dive a little bit more into on yes. when you talk about communicating tone. I think that that is something that most dms probably don't do just like just yeah. straight up um ha, do yeah. like they have conversations about m even like really great ones lines and veils like we're going to talk about player comfort we're going to talk about what your players are interested in um but when you talk about the tone of the game can you talk about that a little bit more it is a pre-session zero, do you want to play in this campaign detail that I think is really necessary. Because it does two things. One, it helps me play the game clearly. Like, I, mm. I think that sometimes I, I felt that when I, I, I really noticed this when I was running an actual play. Yeah. Sometimes my level, like, I think of like, oh, I'm playing D&D. &D. Like, what I think of is D&D. &D. And I don't think about like, is it clear what I have in my head? Yeah. You know, because D&D is a lot of things to a lot of people. Because I've sat down at tables and started doing a voice, and people were like, "Oh, you're one of those," and <laughs> not, not in a mean way, right? Right. But just like surprised. Like, oh, that's not what we think of when we think of D and D. Yeah. You know, and, and that happens across the board. My boilerplate generic D and D may not be anyone else's, mm -hmm. but if I tell people, because like uh, what I'm running a, I'm running a Curse of Strahd game where the characters are from our world, teenagers pulled into the world of Barovia. Okay. Sure. So I tell, so I tell them. Great it's like setting the plot. for that, by the way. For like, because th with the whole miss outside of it, that's exactly. out of any of the D and D adventures. Yeah. So, so I tell them it's like, what if the kids from the you know D and D cartoon didn't get pulled into the D and D cartoon? They got pulled into Dracula. Yeah. You know, and I, the big touch points for the game are Stranger Things and it. And the reason I use it is because I need them to know that the death of minors and violence to minors is on the table because yeah. they are and 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 because it changes the danger dramatically like yeah. one of the issues with curse of strahd as written mm -hmm. is that there's a lot of violence towards children Oh yeah, and, like is. a lot of children in peril, I should say, and and some implied well, I mean, death of children. The very first uh, death house is like the back, yeah, you're right. the background of death house is like a baby smothered in its crib like yeah. and and children who starved and like yeah. but if you are also children it changes the tone of that kind of danger dramatically because no yeah. longer is it trying to target adults with this thing that you know you can get an emotional reaction out of them now it's you know uh, hey, you are also in danger because you are among the like your peers, or it, it it changes it in yeah. a, I think a really interesting way to make that sort of danger more palatable. Yeah, you know, um, but it also makes it really clear to the others like, hey, am I going to enjoy this? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and it lets them know like, okay, what kind of character should I create? Yeah. Uh, the one downside of that pitch is everyone's like, so are we playing someone from the eighties, and I was like, no, I don't. I mean, you can oh, if are we, we all want kids to, on but... bikes, <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, which is another, you know, honestly. I'm sure Kids on Bike was, would be a great setting for 
uh, this format of game uh, as well. A great system, but because I have to do a lot of legwork to figure out how to make them all gain D and D levels, but I've yeah. I found some ways that work really well for that. Nice. Um, but yeah, it's it's being really clear. This is what I'm going for. That's one of the challenges I have when I'm going to run. And part of the benefit for me, especially if I'm doing something, you know, um, either with a paid game where people are fans of my channel or people who know me for a while, is I can be like, hey, if you've seen Critical Role, you kind of know what I like from D&D. &D. Okay. You know, it, it will be similar in tone to the Briarwood arc, you know, if yeah. we're doing Strahd. Or if we're doing something else, it'll be... Spoiler redacted. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. and I can say, like, this is, like, I can say, this is my favorite arc of Critical Role, and that's kind of what I want to go for. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why it's going to be harder for me to sell, uh, you know, sort of pitch slash literally sell the Shadow Dark game that I want to play, because, like, that is not, I have fewer touchstones for that. So that's sort of gotcha. just, like, I'm struggling with how I'm going to pitch that. But that's something really important to me to, like, you need to know what kind of character to create. Yeah. You need to like you need to be able to buy in. Like I if for in the Strahd example, I tell players like, you know, your character knows what you know about vampires and werewolves and, and these kinds of monsters. Right. Um, not what you know from D and D necessarily, but yeah. also also like if you know what you know about D and D, don't assume like I'm telling you the player, don't assume the stat block is gonna be the same. Oh, I mean, um, we'll obviously talk about that later in this video. Or wait, no, actually, I do have your metagaming video as another video I wanted to talk about. That's right. So we'll, we'll talk about that list. during there. Um, yeah. Well, this is really interesting what you're talking about. And I, I, I want to really dissect one of the points. So to use a, you focus on like media touchstones that they might oh, yeah. be familiar with. So you're saying it's going to be like it, it's going to be like Dracula. It's going to be like X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And so that you're putting them in a mindset um that they you know are already familiar with is that that's like kind of the focus yes. of the tone yeah. setting for for me yeah part of that is because i'm a big media guy part of it's because it's really easy for people to go and watch yeah you can just go and watch or, it you know, even if you've never seen yeah. it before yeah interesting okay and so that that's what you're you're kind of recommending now is and that's the reason that you're struggling with this new one is because you don't personally have as many touchstones for that genre exactly I see. Okay, that's very interesting, especially... And part of this, too, because I haven't played Shadow Dark, and I don't know the tone of it yet. Yeah. You know, whereas for Strahd, I played in it first, and, uh, and now I'm running, you know, the first time I ran it, I had a pretty clear idea of what I wanted to do. Now I'm running the same scenario again, so I have an easy, even better opportunity to, like, prepare people for right. the possible pitfalls and things like that, so... That's so interesting. In, um, uh, just another pitch for Bit D really quick. For Blades in the Dark, when Bla in the Blades in the Dark rulebook, it gives you media touchstones. And the Blades in the Dark, like how to run your session zero, tells you to pick media touchstones uh, to describe to your players. So they are they are on the same page as you. Um, that's so interesting. I never I never heard it before Blades, um, but that's that's very very cool. Yeah. Uh, well, and it, I think it's it's really it's just really saves so much time, you know. <laughs> just do it like this, you know. <laughs> this is how I like. It's like this is what I'm going for. If you're not okay with this kind of story, like we'll find a different game. Yeah. Like, this is not going to be the campaign for us to play together, and that's okay. Well, and that's really interesting. I was just talking to someone the other day that was talking about how they've sort of fallen out of of D and D and TTRPGs as a whole because mm -hmm. they've been having some really bad player experiences lately. And the experiences haven't been like anyone's particular fault. So they're yeah. just kind of getting like falling out of love with the, with the system. And they were especially talking about how whenever they play, they really struggle with what sort of character to make. They're normally a DM. And so they just want their, their character to fit they get really yeah. annoyed when they're DMing with the character that doesn't fit, that doesn't mesh, that doesn't make sense within the adventure. And so yeah. they've just been making bounty hunters when they when they go to play. They're like, every character I've ever played has been a bounty hunter because I know, I'm confident that it will fit in any D&D yeah. &D game. And I was like, man, that sucks. I <laughs> <laughs> that sucks that you feel like you can only play that like that one character um 
And I think that what you're talking about, this tone setting, giving media examples, gives them a frame of reference for what kinds of characters would work even within those archetypes. Exactly. Um, Especially if I also give them enough information about the, the premise. Having a right. premise helps a lot. Like, I think we all have this platonic idea that, like, you all create a character and you sit down and you're in a tavern and now you're doing an adventure. And, yeah. like, that can work. But you still got to give them, I, I think, yeah. you still have to give them something. Give yeah. them some idea of, like, what the goal is. What is the tone? Like, is this going to be more Witcher or more Monty Python? <laughs> is this going to be more Princess Bride or more Game of Thrones? Yeah. Because if you Who should if, I be preparing? If you make uh, Scanlan in The Witcher, that would feel weird, but he would work perfectly in Monty Python. So, yeah. yeah. So, I wanted to give you any space. Is there anything else that you feel like Matt does particularly well? Because I think that's a good way to sum it up. But do you have anything mm -hmm. else to say on that? Because obviously, you know, you make a lot of critical role content. You yes. talk about these things in Demystified. If there's one thing that like a DM who has only watched Critical Role that is aware of the effects that we're talking about of like, you know, not everything in an AP works in a home game. Yeah. What are the really like, what are the critical things that Matt really does awesomely? Amazing. I mean, voices. voices. That's that's the most famous one. That's what everyone, that's what everyone thinks is the impressive part of Matt Mercer. Really? That's it not, did, that's be, not the most important part. Wouldn't have even been in my top 10 of things. In if he head. was doing the exact same game and just said, if he tells you that he's going here, he does, he, you know, whatever, you would lose a lot of the the luster of it. That's fair. But the players would still be, the, the players would maybe not be having the same joy they have whenever they discover a new uh, voice that he can do. Yeah. Um, but what they, but he, but his core skill in terms of what makes him a great dungeon master is player reward it is, is, player, is reward. player acknowledgement okay um i i strongly recommend i think i covered this really well in critical world demystified episode 23 okay so uh um, so because because 20 because that's the one where he introduces kynan um Ooh, the the one yeah. who wants to join box machina and um Victor, the Black Powder Merchant. Yes. Yeah, it's when and they're returning those... home from Vasselheim. Well, they start in right. Vasselheim. And everyone's like, oh, Victor's amazing because of the voice. And I'm like, that is not what makes Victor impressive. <laughs> what makes I Victor agree. impressive is that he's Percy's... Um, he's a way to give Percy Black Powder and also validate the fact that Percy's on the edge of fringe science. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the actual impressive part. The fact that he was able to do that improvised off the top of his head... And figure out like okay i need to give him access to get black powder from somewhere but i cannot have a black powder merchant who's buying selling stuff for guns because that cuts his right. legs out from under him yes and so he has to be someone who's collecting black powder just for he's not sure why he's not using yeah. it for guns so he has to be somebody who's kind of eccentric and somebody who people don't go to for the black powder because oh. he has to be somebody who is only doing this this is not a market for anyone else. So, because of because if it's not, because if it's something he, they can just get from a Pokestop, yeah. then um, then he's not then Percy's not impressive anymore. That's so fast. I I I obviously oh, I watched that. I did not pick up on that. That is so insane. No one talks about that. I that's feel like I'm so the only impressive. person who's like that's the actual impressive thing. Yeah. Because I'll tell you, that is not made clear in the cartoon when Victor makes his cameo. Yeah. And it, it doesn't ring the same way. It's yeah. just a funny voice. People no, just watch yeah. it and be like, oh, he looks like the king from, he looks like the old king from Avatar. That was a fun character. And I'm like, you guys, I, you, uh, don't get uh, it. you know, no shame to Sam and Travis when they were adapting the cartoon. They missed what made Victor important. That's so fascinating. Because you're totally right. Even the voice, the voice that was chosen, it's like a kooky prospector yeah. guy that is like wearing his tinfoil hats in the, in the forest. And like, that is interesting because no one else gets Percy. Percy has to interact with the kooks and the cranks right? because and, it's and, cutting edge. And that voice also helps push Percy out of his comfort zone. Yeah. He's not going to someone who's refined and proper like him. It's just a nice opportunity to also give him someone to... It's it's a, it's a, Do you know the shoot your monks principle? No. 
What's that? Shoot your monk's principle is everyone when they're talking about D and D, they're like, "Oh, how do I handle a monk with this incredible ability to catch arrows?" And the answer is, you have people shoot arrows at them, <laughs> yeah. and you let them catch the arrows because it's badass. Yeah. You give them a chance to play the character they made. Yeah. So if you want Percy to be the refined person, sometimes you put him in political situations, and sometimes you put him next to the crazy prospector and just have him be like okay, this is a very strange, and you allow him to be out of his comfort zone, yeah. which is another, and the other thing about Kynan is Kynan functions the same way for, for the audience in general, for the uh, cast in general, by being um, the canary in the coal mine for you have hit the level of fame where this is what people think of you. Yes. You need to start thinking about the way you're perceived. I and then, of course, two episodes later, they kill an old lady because they weren't thinking about this. Yeah. Well, he gave you the clue. He gave you the warning. What you're doing matters, and people are looking at you. So, you know, three episodes after the episode after they killed the old lady, yeah. Matt hits them with a one-two punch of, "Hey, you're don't kill people in cities because we all know who you are now, and it's very dangerous. And also, these old farmers have come for your help because you're famous heroes. Yeah, and you need to rehabilitate your image and think about how." your actions are being perceived. I, I thought that was um, incredible. And you're even like the, the kind I, I, I would almost, it's like a little mini arc with Vax of like, not yeah. just is kind existing and coming to them, a wake up call Vax then, then goes to try and find him because Vax said, go prepare yourself. And Matt hears that and is like, okay. Like, not only is all do all of your actions have consequences, your words and your word choice has consequences of Kynan's gone. He's yeah. off preparing himself, and he wasn't ready, but you, his heroes, told him to go and do that. Yeah, and that's my favorite Tiberius scene. Yeah. Full stop. Is when Tiberius says, like, you attacked a young boy who loved us. Yeah. What if he comes back to your head? And Vax says he won't. And Grog, or you know, Travis says, "Did you not watch The Incredibles?" <laughs> yeah, it's, it's amazing. Great. And then Liam clearly thinks about it more. And like Vax has a has a change of heart privately and keeps going back to try and find him. And he's just not there, which is incredible. It's one of the things that I think Matt does really well that I wish more DMs did of just putting up walls in front of your players. It's something I identified in the very first episode when he just didn't let Tiberius get into the manor. Um, right. He just said, because like, no, how it works. your magic just doesn't work. And, like, he's trying to find Kenan, Kynan, and he's like, he's not there, man. Sorry. He's he's just not there. And, like, yeah. I think the DMs are worried about that because even we've talked about this, uh, this stream about, like, leaning into what your players want. Shoot your monks. Like, lean mm -hmm. into what your players want, but sometimes not giving them what they want is what they want. It's a really complicated well, idea. <laughs> there's a quote from, and and I hate to invoke him because he's 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 not a good person in his private life, but he wrote sure. some good TV shows. Yeah. And, and uh, Joss Whedon. Okay. Um, where, I, I don't know if you've seen Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Um, One of the few, we're, we're, you're, we're hitting on some TV shows that I have. I've seen Buffy all the way through. So obviously the audience wanted Buffy and Angel to get together. Obviously. And, and, and Whedon's quote was, people do not know what they want. Yeah. They don't actually want that. Yeah. So what happens when Buffy and Angel get together? Spoilers for a TV show from 1998. <laughs> but um, he turns evil and becomes the big bad for the season. Yeah. Because what you actually tuned in for is drama and pain. Yes. You know, you do, like, I mean, pff, Brian Michael Bendis got so much crap for putting Daredevil through, like, the worst things he'd ever experienced. And his response was, are you going to buy a comic where he eats a sandwich for 20 pages? <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, you are not. That's why character like, flaws are good, because they provide drama and intrigue and, and yeah. And, yeah, there's and a like, difference between giving them what they want and engaging. There's a difference between giving them what they want and giving them the tools to find what they want in the most dramatic way possible. Yeah, because it's like, I think really like Liam is playing Vex and maybe Liam doesn't even consciously realize it. He's like, I want to find Keenan. But what he really wants is to engage with what he has done, right? Like yeah. that's why he wants to find Keenan is because he wants to engage with this dramatic thing that Matt has presented with him. And the best way for Matt to engage with him on that 
is for Kynan to not be there. So he has to sit in what he has done, and Vax has to, like, mentally deal with it. I, I'll, I'll boil it down even more than that. I'll, I'll actually take it a little further back than that. Yeah. It's not that he wants to engage with what he's done. It's that he's trying to fix what he did wrong. Mm -hmm. And if he's allowed to do that, then there was no consequence for that mistake. Yeah, he wants to he wants to fix it, and it is more interesting for him to struggle with fixing it than to just right. do it. There has to be a, and obviously I have the benefit of knowing where the storyline goes. Right. But like, there has to be a consequence for his attempt at a scared straight, like, yeah. hey kid, it's rough out there. And like, the, the difficulty too, and I, I'm giving you more homework, but I made a video about <laughs> how our adventure is perceived. And that question is really important for world building. Yeah. Because you need to know... How common are wizards? How common are fighters? Do people know the difference between a sorcerer and a warlock and a, and a wizard? A you know, whatever. Percent. Yeah. But also, players need to kind of be aware of that too. And that was Matt's attempt at, like, you know, telling um, the players, like, hey, you're being thought of as heroes. But Vax was kind of already there because Vax has always been, we're in the Underdark, we're trying to kill Kavarn, and we need to stop him from destroying the surface world. Yeah. Matt, like, Liam thrives on Liam is a Lord of the Rings guy. Mm. And so for him, the storylines where they're not, and you'll you, you just minor spoilers for what's coming later in campaign one, when there are moments where the, the stakes are not life and death, are more mercenary, he disengages. Mm. That is not what he came to the table for. He, he's so for there him, for the heroic fantasy. Yeah. So for him, Kynan can't just skip to the front of the line and become a member of Vox Machina. And he's right. Yeah. Vox kind of would not become a level 12 adventurer in a heartbeat and be able to uh, to join. Yeah. Um, but the fact that he's aware of that does not mean that his, just means that his uh, attempt at scaring Kynan off of that yeah. had, uh, had more consequences. other consequences. Cool. Well, thank you for joining. I'm debating. Yeah, I'll stop my stream too. Um, okay. <laughs> so thank everyone all of you for joining audience people i know i normally talk to the audience more but i i was having too much fun um <laughs> i know i'm so curious what they were chatting about i have to i have to check out the live chat after the fact i know i was occasionally looking over just to make sure things were cool but it all seemed dope um but Perfect. thank you for everyone who came from mike i appreciate it uh and hopefully you know you'll you'll uh keep keep watching both of us but leave yeah. a comment with what you wish we'd gotten a chance to talk about this time maybe something we mentioned maybe something we yeah. didn't and uh we'll talk about that next time probably or probably we won't but we'll try gosh mike is such a better creator than me i i have struggle with coming up like what to smash that about. like button don't forget to subscribe <laughs> <laughs> all right ring that bell let's go let's see if we get a thousand likes i'm gonna take a scanlan shit on stage all right i'll see you later bye <laughs>